Hi, this is Sheree with Rehash Fiber, and today I'm going to take you on an adventure through Arizona for fiber art. Welcome all you fiber artists across the world. Fiber art is way more than what happens in the studio, in our yarn stores, running through our hands. It is a whole world out there that makes up the fiber art world. And I love exploring it. So today I would love for you to come with me as I explore the Sedona, Arizona region. So check out what the area looks like. It is gorgeous. When I came off the highway and started heading towards the town of Sedona, it turned into a beautiful, magical, red rocked wonderland. I found our feature artist today on Instagram. You know I have my morning cup of coffee and I scroll through my highly curated fiber art Instagram and I came across the skeins of yarn that blew my mind. So I immediately started digging deeper, like who is this person? Where does she live? What's going on? I found out she lived not far from Sedona at all in Prescott Valley, which was like an hour, hour and a half drive. Everything worked out, set up a meeting with her, and we had a fantastic time. So I want you to check it all out. So meet Jeremy of my mother's daughter, Handspun, and I want you to just hear and see all about this great art yarn that she produces. So it obviously is a homage to my mother, but uh, she's an artist. And so that, she painted these in high school. I'm not an artist in that way. <laughs> yarn is it. That's my, my medium. So like growing up, she was always trying to get me to do stuff, you know, she'd bring things home and uh, all kinds of stuff. So she was a hand weaver. She would dye her own yarn. Yeah, so it's just, it was always there, you know, and it wasn't until I lived, Ten so she, she taught me to sew. She always tried to teach me to sew, too. She's a, a, a seamstress. And uh, so we, we got stationed in Japan. Before we left, she bought me a sewing machine for my birthday. It kind of sent me off with, <laughs> with a baby girl and a sewing machine. And it was funny. Once, once she wasn't there to do it for me, uh -huh. all the stuff she taught me actually started, like, coming to me. I actually started sewing things. And awesome. then when my husband was deployed, that's where the yarn came in. So we... Um, we're stationed in California. That came after we moved from Japan to California. And he got sent to Afghanistan for the entirety of 2014. So he left in January, came back at the end of November. And kind of through that, it's like I've always been crafty and creative. But I just started like feeling this overwhelming need to like make things. And so I kept trying stuff and I couldn't really get a rhythm. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, Nacho Libre. No. That one. Anyway, there's a scene where he's like, because he wants to be a wrestler, but he's really bad at it. And he's like, God, why did you give me this desire? But make me such a stinky warrior. <laughs> you know, that's that's like how I felt. I was like, I have this overwhelming need to create things, but I'm really bad at all of this. And so I really just prayed about it. I was like, tell me what to do with this, because it's it's here, uh -huh. and I like it's not making me feel good, you know. And so I went to visit my parents um, while my husband was deployed. Took the two daughters at the time, and was like, I need a a thing to do to keep my hands busy. So I bought like a knitting book. I was trying mm -hmm. to teach myself to knit. And it was while learning to knit, I came across, um, I, I discovered that like fatter yarn, like made things go faster. <laughs> and I was like, I like this. So I started looking for that and then I came across knit collage. Are you familiar with knit collage? No. Uh -huh. right, so if you look them up, it's, it's a, it's commercial. It was well, not commercial. They, they have, I think it's in India or somewhere that they have ladies hand spin it for them, but they sell it, you know, in, in yarn stores and things like that. But it's, it's art yarn, but it's, it's real usable, you know, mm -hmm. they sell it, to, mm -hmm. it's meant to knit with and things like that. So, but once I saw it, it has like daisies and flowers and mm -hmm. sparkles. And once I saw that, I was like, like, okay, like yeah, regular yarn is never <laughs> going to make me happy ever, ever again. So like my mom just being who she is and how she is, you know, she was like, well, you can, you can make yarn, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah. How, how do I do that? You know? Mm -hmm. So she 
put together a little CD drop spindle with a, it was like a cup hook and a, it was supposed to be a dowel rod, but I think she actually used one of the leaf sticks from her, one of her lamps, actually one of these. <laughs> and um, put a cup hook at the end and then some CDs on one and made a drop spindle. Uh -huh. And then she just happened to have roving in her closet. I don't know why. Like she wasn't a spinner, but she uh -huh. was like, oh, you know, I just thought I'd try sometime. Uh -huh. She just, that's how yeah, she's got everything. So I just started YouTube videos and trying to figure it out. And somehow just like of all the things I've ever tried to do, it just clicked. I don't, I don't know. It just, so I started spinning in 2014 with my little CD drop spindle uh -huh. and um, she was teaching me to dye, dye yarn because we, you know, I was, I was there for about a month and a half. It, he was deployed so I could travel, you know, as long as I wanted, as long as the kids were cool. So mm -hmm. um, she taught me to dye and things like that. At least gave me enough info so when I got back home, I could kind of explore it further and mm -hmm. figure it out. And so for Christmas that year, I got my first spinning wheel, which was, a, um, they're not in business anymore. It was Blue Bonnet. Mm. It was the brand, and it was the Crafty Bee. At the time, it was the Crafty Bee. They since made a one-pound bobbin. They've upgraded it after 2015, but it was called the Crafty Bee. It had big open orifice and eight-ounce bobbins, and uh, it was just wonderful. Actually, I sold it, but then I just bought it back like, oh! two months ago, so it's, it's in my closet. I have I'm my bee. I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's like I, I don't need two wheels, really, but uh. I'm like, I want my bee back. So then I found the, this is the Ashford Kiwi. Yeah. And so it's a Kiwi 3 with a super flyer. This one, I tried it at the um, Fiber Creek, the local mm -hmm. um, spinning and weaving store, and just loved it. It was like, I, as soon as I sat down, it was, she had the four ounce set up, so I sat down and started spinning cotton, and it was just like, oh, it's just oh, perfect. It just, just does what I want it to. Like, there's nothing that I want to do that I can't do with this wheel, so I just... I love it. I did buy back my bee when I saw it for sale online just because oh, yeah. just because she's mine. And I, I love that. her. Okay, so the glitter. This so, is wonderful. Did you yes, do that? Yes. 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 So pretty. So it's Hemway it. Hemway glitter. Uh -huh. And you can mix it with anything. Like you can I, I was really close to putting it on my walls. I almost because oh. it's a paint additive. Okay. And so I got just a clear lacquer and uh -huh. put it in there and then painted it on all the That is the really edges. pretty. It's, Look at that one. It's spinning. It. Yes, it's like it's oh my favorite. Oh my gosh. So and I could just sit and stare at it all day. <laughs> and so I did all my little so pretty. see there. Yeah. Yeah. So it that was that was fun. So then all the leftover I let the girls go out and paint all the rocks outside. So <laughs> you got you got like <laughs> random glitter rocks outside, but it kept them busy for a long time too. It, it's a lot of fun. And it it doesn't fall off. Like, yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, it does it. It stays yeah. put. It's really great stuff. So, Hemway glitter. Yeah, so that's that's my kiwi, and then my bee is in here. Yeah. So this oh, look like at that. That's yeah. great. It's, it's a neat wheel. And so that folds down. But this is really nice. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's what this has that this one doesn't. It's just the, the real open orifice. Only, like, bee fiber had is, like, to have an open orifice, but then the sliding hook was pretty limited. So... Like this here is me trying to come up with an alternative to the sliding hook. So I have been experimenting with it. So I'm like, if I can get past that, then this one will do anything. Because I use a lot of buttons and uh, I love big giant buttons. But yeah, I have like a mild obsession with like vintage fabric. And <laughs> so all of that's been really fun to try to work into yarn. I kind of just go into a craft store or a thrift store and look around and be like, how could I? Get this in yarn. Mm. Oh, oh, there it all is. <laughs> the beautiful art yarn that I've seen on Instagram. Oh my gosh. Okay. I just, I love antique fabric. And just the idea of like these things used to make someone really, really happy. And now they're like past their life. But then now find a new way to make people happy with them again, you know? Yeah. So and let them keep on keep on living. Wow. Yeah, and so a lot of the beaded fabrics are um Indian sari. They're mm. the, the more formal saris, but they, every time I order them and stuff it says it's that they're vintage and antique and some of them are half fallen apart, but it works because you, you use such small pieces of them. It can kind of give them some new life, which makes me happy. Yeah. Wow. 
you don't have to make money off of it. <laughs> you can just go and enjoy. Like, yeah, but something in me wants to, it wants to, I think it's Proverbs 31, right? Where it's like she sees the work of her hands, sees that it is good, so she sells it. That's awesome. That's, that's what, I, what I do. So, yeah, and I like the idea of like hidden treasures too. Like you mm -hmm. never kind of, never find all the things. So this one I actually have set aside. It's going to be a purse. It's oh. Be a bag. And this leather here. Go with it. I think those oh colors will be gosh. really pretty. Yeah, so I just have to get motivated to warp my loom. <laughs> so I'm trying to like change directions from one thing to the other. It always takes me a little time. But once I get there, that's going to be a handbag. How did you even think to get started of putting all that cool stuff so, you know, it started actually mm. really pretty early on. So I started, I started spinning in 2014. I think I sold my first skein of yarn towards the end of 2015. And uh, it was one that I called like Funky Nana was the type of yarn. And it was inspired by, um, uh, she went by Dottie Angel. I can't remember what her, 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 her real name is, but I found this really cool book on Granny Chic. And I didn't want to call it Granny Chic because I didn't want to like steal from her. So my kids call my mom Nana. So I was like, all right, we'll, we'll call it Funky Nana. But it just started with like, I had some crocheted lace and other things and buttons and just kind of mixed it all together. And I, at the time I didn't have a drum carter. All I had was a wool picker. So I just sent it all through the wool picker together to see what would happen. And it kind of came out in this big fluffy mess with lace and all kinds of stuff in it and so I started spinning that and it sold right away so I was wow. like okay wow people like that so I was like okay what else could I put in yarn <laughs> and so I really do just I spend a lot of time at craft stores just going hmm how could I get this in yarn and I'm kind of I'm a problem solver and so I'm like if there's a way to do it I'm going to figure out how <laughs> and I'll like I'll sit and just think yeah. how could I get what I want Bring up energy and then releasing the energy into the draft and I think doing that creates, when you do that on the wheel, it creates a lot of room to, and I'll show you what I mean when I'm, when I'm doing it, but um, creates a lot of, like you just, you use that energy and the twist hmm. into the draft to sculpt, kind of, I, I don't know, like it, it I'll, I'll show you what I mean when, <laughs> when I'm doing it. Someone once told me to really know how to do something, you have to be able to explain it. I'm like, well... I think I can explain it. <laughs> I'll do my best. But I, I really spent a lot of time trying to learn how to spin. Not, I mean, I get, and I'm not gonna tell anybody what their art, what their yarn needs to be, especially if it's art yarn, but like beginner yarn can certainly be art yarn, right? I don't have a problem with people calling it that, mm -hmm. especially if it helps them get past imperfect yarn. But not all art yarn is beginner yarn. You know, mm -hmm. there's methods and my, um, Education was in psychology. I spent a lot of time doing statistics, and um, for something to be useful, it had to be valid and reliable, right? And so it meant you needed to be able to repeat it. And so I've kind of taken that into my spinning. Like I don't like accidental yarn. Like it's none of this is accidental. It was all created with intention. And mm -hmm. as long as there's wiggle room with color and texture, like I can repeat it. Mm -hmm. oh, it's repeatable. Like there's method and technique here, you know? So mm -hmm. that became important to me. Like I wanted the control. I want to know what's going on between the the fiber, my hands, the twists, the tension, all of that, so that I can use it to get what I want. And so mm -hmm. I don't spin fine yarn often, but I can, you know? So like mm -hmm. I, I know I know what I'm doing. I could do that if I wanted mm -hmm. to. And I, and I have, I just, I don't do it often enough to really be really good at it. I would say the most consistent yarn I spin is probably slub yarn, which is intentionally, um, you know, the thick and thin. So, but it's, it's pretty consistent. It's uh, where the slubs are. Um, see, I don't have any of my, my normal hand spun. I don't think. Oh, here's, this is probably the most normal I get. Let's see. So, so I can do it. Mm. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I don't often. Because I get bored. I like, I, I can only do so much of one thing at once uh -huh. because I, it, I just don't have the attention span for it. Okay, so as I'm looking at all your beautiful art yarn, my question is, what do you do with it? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. 
So I knit more than, than weave. So I do weave, but I knit more than I weave. So this was actually done on, actually if you want to hold that, feel how heavy it is. I'm going to grab oh, wow. the needles that I knitted on. Wow. Check this out. That is great. These are the two pairs that I use the most. These are my, my 70s and my 50s. Wow, we. <laughs> so this one was actually knitted on the 70s. You can see the big stitches in the back uh -huh. pretty easily. But the idea with art yarn is that the yarn is the art. So it's like I wouldn't cable or do really any fine, intricate patterns with this because it's going to get lost in the texture. Mm -hmm. And then the texture is going to get lost mm -hmm. in the knitting. So it's like you want really big, open stitches and really simple techniques wow. so that the yarn can be what shows and it's kind of fun that especially if you're um, just learning and stuff like you don't have to know how to do anything you know, like the yarn is doing mm -hmm. the work the yarn is the art so a lot of people weave with it and you can take really simple techniques for weaving wall hangings but then you know it, mm -hmm. it looks like art because the yarn itself is and I've honestly had people just tell me they just Coil it up on the middle of their table for centerpieces. <laughs> like, you know. So, and I'm like, I would just hang it on the wall. Like the yarn itself is art, and so anything you do with it beyond that is up to you. But I try really, really hard to make yarn that will withstand whatever you want to do with it. So, like, I made up this pattern. Obviously, there's not a lot out there for 70s needles with sequins, uh -huh. um, and I had to pull it out. Like, so this was un <laughs> unknitted multiple, multiple times, oh. and the yarn still held up. The sequins are all still there. Um, so yeah, I just, I really, I like to make usable yarn so that the only thing you're limited by is your own ideas. You know, like I, I don't want it to fall apart when you're using it. I don't want you to not be able to cut it in certain places. Mm -hmm. um, I want it to work for you. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's always my goal. And so, yeah, so this is one example. Fantastic. And this one is a different kind of yarn. So and this is just an old vintage, I don't know, I liked the the puppies, but um, got it at a thrift store and then added the sleeves to it. But this is some of the button yarn. And so that's just, oh my gosh, that's yeah. great. And so I knit more than I do anything. Cause yeah, I just try to get really creative with stuff. Like there's a uh, dissolvable interfacing, like for embroidery and sandwich yarn scraps in between it. And then just stitch it like crazy on the sewing machine. Oh. And then you let the, interfacing dissolve and you've got essentially so that's how I made my um my purse but this one is the cotton and uh, I actually have some of it in there so you can feel it it gets really nice um, so this is one where yeah I stitched it all so these are I don't throw anything away these are all scraps and they were stitched together between the um, dissolvable interfacing so um, yeah, let me put that on my model here. <laughs> and they're the kind of things, like you gotta be able to try them on. Like it just doesn't, cause they're not like normal hats. So when I try loom weave, there's always a lot of fringe to cut off. So I just don't throw anything away cause you can always use it. And so, and then, so I'll kind of pick the shape that I wanna do it in and cut the interfacing to match that and then so and then lay it all out on the interfacing and I'll pin it down and then stitch like crazy. And then you pick up the stitches along the edge and then knit your hat. You kind of have to be comfortable with making up your own patterns as you go to do it that way. I depend a lot on the texture in the yarn. And so you can see the, the scraps from this one came from this, this project here. And this is a trilum shawl with the art yarn throughout. You see there's a lot of the feathered yarn in this one. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and so I'll buy, so this one has lace, it's got trim, and um, so yeah, anything's fair game. And then, so this is trim here, and then the sequence here is trim as well. And so, yeah, there's, there's really just That's nothing I won't try. Um, <laughs> I'll try. I can't make everything work, and I don't post photos of my fails usually. Maybe I should. <laughs> but, yeah, there's not much I won't at least try to get into my yarn. Everything's fair game. And then my... I think it's one of the things that makes 
my work unique too is really just the amount of time I will spend finding what I want. <laughs> I don't know that is most that part people... of the fun? Oh yes, like a treasure hunt. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Well, so like a, a, like I was saying, I, I've always been really a lot more academic in nature than artistic, and so research makes me weird. Like I love research. I'm a, I'm a big nerd, and I will sit and research whatever it is I'm looking for, and I kind of just taken that into finding what I want. <laughs> you know. So it's like, if it's out there, I'll find it. And, that, and then this one here was fun. This trim actually came from, it was just a thrift store find. But it's like the super shaggy, almost pom-pom type stuff. And so and it is actually in this blue yarn here. Throughout, let me see if I can find it. Here it is. See, so it's actually a part of the yarn there. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so it's just... It's fun to experiment. Like I said, not everything works, but um, a big part of the joy for me is the, the, the figuring it out. And like, if, if I see a thing and I really want it to be a part of the yarn, like I, I will work with it until I figure out how to make it, not just stay, but like stay well and usable. So here's another, a little less going on than the other. So this one had this, um, I bought this pretty, it's silk, and so I dyed it. But it's like the trim pieces. I don't know if you can see. It's like, here's a piece hanging down. So it's kind of this, this trim edge. And I ordered it from India and I just, I loved it, but it was really thin. So I did, um, my mom taught me when I was a little girl how to use the, like, I think it's called a loose set. Weave in it, so it's almost like a chain knitting thing, kind of. So I was like, oh, you know what? So I made a fatter yarn that way out of it. Yeah, so it's got a lot of trim. It's got the feathered yarn. Then it also has cotton. This is a cotton hand spun as well. And so the green, I don't know if you were able to get in touch with Andrea Green or not. Um, she's the one that does that and carded it with cotton and spun this yarn to match these with the, the thread remnants. And so for the smaller scarves, I like doing it that way just because when it's right under your neck as opposed to draped over your back, you kind of, oops, I think I got it backwards you want it to hang better. Yeah, so that one's got the feathered button yarn throughout. Yeah, and I really think for me, it's like I figured out that weird stuff won't necessarily ruin my drum carter. <laughs> Once I figured that out, it was on. There's nothing I won't send through my drum carter. Like I don't send the buttons through, but most anything else is, is pretty fair game. That one's knit as well, but it's got my my curtain dangles come from it. I, I love this. This particular trim is one of my favorites. I actually bought everything they had on eBay. So, and two, once I find something I like, I'll hoard it. I'll go out, I'll buy all of it. <laughs> it's how they apply to exercise psychology, but it, it applies across the board. And so uh, self-determination theory it examines um, different different levels of motivation. and. And pure joy or intrinsic motivation is, is, is the idea that you do a thing just because you enjoy it. But the mm -hmm. second you start adding external rewards, that intrinsic motivation goes down. And so money is a big extrinsic motivator. Mm -hmm. And so I try really hard to find this balance between like not letting the money become the motivator because I want the joy to be the motivator because I think what people are buying or at least what they see is my joy. Like it's, like I love doing this. And I think the second I stop loving it, that's gonna show. So this one, it was the um, dissolvable interfacing and stitched, I, I put it in rows and then stitched back and forth. So it kind of looks woven, but it's not, it's sewn. And then that interfacing, just you, you soak it for a bit and it just dissolves right out. And I just laid the yarn across it in rows and then put the other piece on it and put pins around to kind of hold it in place and then just stitched back and forth over the um the interfacing because the machine you know all this stuff will get caught up in the the feed dogs on the machine but the interfacing makes it smooth and so it just glides right over it and then you soak it all that interfacing dissolves and then you're left with the the stitched together pieces floor looms and so she would always wait till we went to bed to work on stuff so, so i would like lay in bed at night and go to sleep to the sound of the little cranking. You know, it's like the metal on metal mm -hmm. crank from the loom. And I'm like, oh, that sound. And so now when I when I do it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I remember that. 
<laughs> it's, it's really sweet and nostalgic. And uh, yeah, every time I do it, it makes me think of my mom. So it's uh, even if she would never weave this way. <laughs> so yeah, and so this is another sequin one done on the size 70s. So it was knit. So, and again, you gotta be pretty confident to wear it, but it sure is fun to make. And my kids really like them. So that's, that's another thing too. If they don't sell and I get tired of looking at them, I let the kids play in them. Cause I really just made it cause it makes me happy. So. Then again, it comes down to that motivation. You're making it so you can sell it, not because you enjoy it. I'm like, it's, it's gotta be about the joy. So I frequently have to kind of step back and examine my motives and kind of re recalibrate and, and remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, uh, and it's not to make money, although that is a nice extra. <laughs> it's got to be extra because, uh, yeah, it's the joy is what what makes me want to do it. But at the same time, I don't, I don't want like. It's like the world already has my stuff, you know? Like I want like I want people to do their thing so that the world can have my stuff and their stuff. You know, like there's never gonna be enough fiber art. So all of these are kind of more the same, different colors more the same. But uh yeah, just examples of how how I do it. And um I don't do wall weavings, but a lot of people do. And that's what a lot of my yarn is sold for. And some people do, people do just amazing things. Are you familiar with Backstory Fiber? Mm -hmm. Okay, look her up. She's in Canada, but she, it's funny. She's actually in Prescott, Canada. <laughs> but um, she uses a lot of my yarn. And she'll, I don't do custom yarns a lot because, again, it's that motivation thing. I found when I'm doing it for someone else, it just, I, I can't explain it. It's just like, oh, it's just not fun anymore. It's work. Mm -hmm. But for her, she'll just kind of give me an idea. And then she lets me just do what I do. And uh, within, like, you know, she needs a particular colorway or something like that. But a lot of times people will message me and be like, can you just make this yarn? And it's like, I'm not a yarn fairy. I'm a, you know, like, <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> but, uh, so, but I have a few people that I will do custom orders for. And it's usually because they're just like, hey, I just need you to make what you make. And I need this amount of yardage. Or, you know, here's what I'm working on. Here's my idea. You know, what can you do with it? And so, like, Bria in, in uh, Canada will, will give me... You know, like she was doing like an Ever After, like the movie Ever After. She was like, I need that theme. So I was like, ooh, ooh, I got it. You know, so I'll pull things out and I'll send her pictures and she'll give me feedback and things like that. And then usually it just comes together and we just, we work really well together. But if you get a chance to look at her Instagram, she uses a lot of my yarn and she's incredibly talented and uh, does the, a lot of the wall weaving. My grandma, when she passed away, she was working on a knitting. Um, it was an afghan, but it's all cabled on like size tens, you know, and that's just not how I knit. So I've got this section of her afghan and I want to start adding to it, mm -hmm. like my the way, my style and my kind of work and eventually make a wall hanging out of it. Like I think that's what I'm going to do with it. So that will be my foray into wall hanging weaving, but until then, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll just start hanging my shawls on the wall. <laughs> maybe. And so it, this is, have you ever heard of fabric slashing? Are you familiar no. with that? No. Okay, so this was, Two layers of fabric. It's this gray quilter's cotton. Um, and I laid all my yarn scraps between these two layers of fabric. And then just sewed straight lines. And then just take really sharp scissors and just snip the top layer of fabric. And then everything kind of just <gasps> pours out from in between. Wow, that's really cool. So, yeah, so I just made it as a rectangle. Used it as a piece for the front. My fun lining in purses. And so it's held up really well. It's been like two years. I'm like, okay, I need to make more of these. That's great. And uh, so yeah, I want to do a woven panel. I okay. kind of do it the same way, do it woven, and then do the leather on the back. Because I found that when I do bags, if, if the the wool is on this side and it rubs, mm -hmm. it gets pilly mm -hmm. or dye transfers. So I like having the leather on the back. But it's really held up well. And uh, I kind of it was my prototype. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I was kind of again, I'm just making it up as it goes. Good well. And so this is the kind of stuff that I look for. I just, anything, I'll look for evening gowns, like vintage, like mother of the bride type stuff that's just over the top beaded. This is actually a wrap or a shawl or something. But then I'll, I'll just deconstruct it and keep the, you know, I'll cut along and keep all of that. And then that's, that's going to be a yarn eventually. So I haven't got a real plan for it yet. The whole edge is beaded. So it's got, you know, I'll get a lot out of it. And that's, that's the kind of stuff I will spend hours just looking for things. And my, my kids love it. They, they like to go to the thrift store and look for stuff too. They like to get ideas.
And I just, I love giving new life to stuff, you know, because it's like there was a time when that gave somebody ideas. Like it made them feel special or feel pretty when they put it on. And uh, so now it's going to get a new chance at life. <laughs> and hopefully make someone else smile for a little bit longer. And it's like eventually my head will just get so many ideas that it's about to explode and I've got to get them out. And that's when I'll try, try the new stuff. And so like these, I actually, usually along the selvage of the, the fabric, it'll like have a name or something. And so this one, I actually found that the company went out of business, but it was done in the fifties. This is a screen printed one. I actually just found this yesterday and it's from the sixties. It's like the prints are just awesome. And the colors and a lot of times even I'll just use it for color inspiration. You know, like somebody did the work, those colors go really well together. So then I'll try to recreate that, you know, in a bat and turn it into yarn. And so, but yeah, just a lot of these texts up like those were drapes up there and I love the colors. So it's like they're kind of just here to inspire, you know, like the color, like the color combinations, different textures. Every now and then I'll cut them up and put them into yarn. Otherwise I'll put them together. I, I do upcycle clothing as well. So a lot of this stuff, so here's my, my fabric scraps that I'll use. Like I order these off the internet. This is like my favorite. I'll pull this out and just get lots of inspiration. So a lot of times I'll just like see things next to each other and think like, oh wow, that's really pretty together. And I'll, I'll work with it that way. But these are pieces from uh, different, different garments, usually vintage or antique. Sometimes I'll cut them up and spin them into yarn, but then sometimes I get them in these full pieces. And I don't want to cut it up because I'm like, oh, I could see how that would be part of something. And so I've started, let me show you, let me see, this one's a good example. So I don't, I don't have like the patience to knit entire sweaters. So I figured out how to add sleeves to t-shirts, <laughs> but then also adding the, the appliques from the vintage um, dresses to kind of, I don't know, create my own thing, but it lets me use these, these fabric pieces more. I see them and I don't want to cut them because it's like I can see where they've been and they have a lot of potential. Some of them are already in scraps and those are the ones that I'll put into yarn. So with the heavier fabrics I can use the art yarn. Like with t-shirts the art yarn's a little too heavy so I have to find more lightweight stuff. Got for this stuff though because it just like if you're wanting to buy yarn you're not wanting really to buy pre-made stuff. You know what I mean? Like if, if it's already made. So and this is a rodeo town. It's a western town so I found these um like rodeo tops at the thrift store. I decided to turn them into dusters. But it, yeah, so it's like old shirts, but this is an old comforter. It's like it's stuff that's made people happy for years. And now, hopefully it'll keep making people happy. We'll see if I can ever get it out there. I need to get it in front of people. <laughs> so that, and then this one was one of my favorites. I like how it turned out. I can get it off. Here. And so that's one of those fabric pieces. And it's all just kind of like a chain reaction, kind of. Like you said, there's just no end to any of this. I started ordering fabric to make yarn, or the, these kind of, you know, neat beaded swatches. And uh, when she would send them to me, sometimes they were in these full pieces, and that inspired, you know, like the garments. And so it's just, it's just kind of this rabbit hole. And they all sort of go together, which is really cool. But it... It's nice to be able to have lots of different projects and still kind of be in the same, you know, I don't need a bunch of new tools or different things to kind of branch out here and there. And so like it all kind of goes together. So I don't know, it's, it's really, really been a cool, a cool outlet. And because I am a stay at home mom with four kids, um, even though like I, I've always been a real active, um, kind of career minded person. So when I made that shift, it was kind of hard to just get comfortable being at home, you know, like without getting bored or feeling like you weren't doing something productive, even though it all is, it doesn't always feel that way. So, but this has given me something that makes me really happy to just be home. Like there's nothing I would rather do than just sit at home and make stuff. And uh, it has really been just a blessing in that way because yeah, it's, it's hard to have four kids and <laughs> feel the urge to be out of the house all the time. Like, you need to 
it, it's just life is easier if you stay close to home. And so having a thing that makes you happy to be there is, has been really cool. I always call it my domestic arts. I love buttons. And this isn't really something I even knew about myself until I started putting buttons in yarn. But I am obsessed. I will look for hours <laughs> for buttons. But I like not just any buttons, you know, like I love, like if, if I see like a, a, a big bag of buttons, all shirt buttons, like I'll, I'll pass over it. I don't, I don't think you're going to find any shirt buttons in this box. But these are my, my pride and joy. So when I, when I put buttons in yarn, usually, um, the main expense from my yarn comes from the contents of it. Not necessarily the work I put into it because I love the work and it's really, really hard for me to price it because I'd be doing it anyway. So I kind of price it by the contents. And so like the antique, like they're genuinely vintage and antique buttons. I don't go to Hobby Lobby and pick stuff that just kind of looks that way. You know, like I'll, I'll search for hours. These come from Etsy and eBay and you know, I'll, I think the most I spent on a button lot was probably $150. And it was worth every penny. It like, it, <laughs> it made me so happy. Button here? What's that? No, so it wasn't one button. It was a lot. It was, okay. it was several. Um, some of them are in here. Most of them have gone into yarn and, and um, most, most of them have gone to Bria probably. Um, she did a series of Wonderland, like Alice in Wonderland weaves. Oh, okay. And so we did um, the White Rabbit and, and Alice and the Cheshire Cat. And so a lot of those buttons went into that one. But yeah, so this is frequently if I just need inspiration, I'll just dump my buttons out and, and sort through my buttons Oops. and come up with things. So I'll show you this yarn that I'm going to do next. That's the coarse bun and coils and then one's like kind of the big shells. And so this one is going to be the shells and these are my little goose feathers. But I pulled out all my fabric scraps that I'm going to use. And I kind of just, like I said, I just go through my little scrap basket and find what, what I think looks really pretty together. But then these are the buttons that I picked out to go with it. And so this one kind of inspired the whole thing. Usually that's how it works. I'll find like one that I think is just super cool. And I wanna do the whole yarn based off this one button. And so that's what happened with this one. So it's gonna have kind of, they're sort of primary colors, yellow and blue and red, which I don't do a lot of. That's a little darker than what I usually do, but I liked the vintage look of all of these together. And so, I love big buttons. These, I grab them because they make great core, core yarn because it grabs on everything. And that's too, like when it comes to the quality of the yarn, I try to really think through what am I, what's my core? Cause that's gonna create or add stability to the yarn. And then what am I plying with? Like that's important too, because like you don't want weak yarn. So it's like, I like a strong core and a strong plying thread. That way, kind of all the stuff in between is gonna have, it's gonna benefit from the stability of the, um, the core and the ply. So it kind of gives a lot of forgiveness to all this other extra stuff in here. But yeah, so you see when you, when you core spin, you kind of, I have a video about this on my YouTube, um, kind of color control when you're core spinning. So for me, I, I draft with my right so everything that's on the right side of the fiber is gonna show more. So if there's like a thing you really want to show, then I'll move it to where it's on the outside. Whereas when you're doing a regular spin, you don't quite get that kind of control. Isn't that cool? Yeah, so then you just let lock that it. Big yep. thing go on in. Let it go. And it's funny, you have to, I think I talk about that in one of my YouTube videos too, when I'm talking about how to um, course spin these threads. It's, um, you've got to like be willing to let go. <laughs> the idea that it needs to be perfect. Because when you ply it and stuff and all of the, the texture and stuff that's already in it, like it's all going to balance out. So there isn't much that I won't try to send through my wheel or through my carter. And they're both good sports. This too, if you find, I mean, a lot of spinning tools, like they're so well-made. 
they really can withstand a lot. So like here, for example, like I really like this stuff and the color of it. So I want that to be what shows here. So if I leave this here, then that red is what's gonna show as I'm, tw as I'm spinning. But if I move it to where this is on the outside, then that's gonna take over. And so it kind of, it's one of those things that doesn't seem that important, but it's like if you're a control freak like I am, and you really want what you want. And sometimes it's fun to just be totally random. But there are times when I really want a particular color in a section to show. Where it's real fun when you get a big clump of like glitter like this. Let me get to that. And I want that to show, so I'm gonna keep all of that out on the right side. So then you get like this super shiny section. So yeah, that's one of the things I like about core spinning. It kind of lets you decide what's gonna go where. And you gotta be okay with muscling your bat around too. Like you're in charge of it. Yeah, so like I want, obviously when you put something like this in there, you want it to show. If it was over here, mm -hmm. then all of that would wrap around it and you wouldn't see anything except the little edges of that poking out. So I want it over on the far right side. Again, because I draft with my right, so if I was drafting with my left, I'd want it on the, the left side. But then that way, that's what's sticking out. It's not buried under all the other stuff. So I'm going to turn it because I want that brown. Not blue. So yeah, I think a lot of times when you see art yarn, it just seems really random. And it can be but I try really hard to <laughs> make it what I want. And, um, history kind of from the home too, which I think is special. Cause yeah, my mom was a stay at home mom. And so she kind of, she had the time to sit and really try to teach me all this stuff that at the time I didn't <laughs> think would have an effect later. But it's all in there. And that's every now and then I'll call her. I'm like, remember that time you taught me? I was listening. And she'll, she'll do that too. She's like, I had no idea you were even paying attention. Some of the add-ins I'll throw in while I'm carding. But a lot of them come in during the plying. And that's why like choosing a plying thread that's really good and strong is important. Because then it can withstand anything. A lot of times with beads and things like that, it can cut. You know, if they're made of glass mm -hmm. and they have a rough edge. So I try to choose, um, I use warping cotton a lot. And uh, I'll even go like to Hobby Lobby or Joann's and get like a bonded nylon or the heavy duty thread. That way it's really thin so you can um, get it between a lot of things or wrap several times before you even notice it. But it's really strong, like pulling on it isn't gonna break it. And that's kind of what you want. I don't ply with just um, like all purpose thread and things like that, I used to but I've, I've learned my lessons, especially because I do weave. And so um, I always figure a good challenge is making yarn that could actually be a, a warp um, and put under tension like that. Because I, I found a lot of art yarn, if I want it to be a warp and I start tensioning it, it'll come apart. And so I kind of always think of that as a challenge. Like, okay, make a yarn that could be used as a warp if you mm -hmm. wanted it to. Single spun yarn usually can't can't handle that because when you start putting it under tension it redistributes that twist and will draft apart in places. Um, but yeah, once it's plied, if it's plied with something good and the core is nice and strong, then you should be able to use it. Now, here come some of those threads and they just wad up like that mm. and I just go with it and then it's awesome. Oh yeah. Isn't that great? Uh-huh. So yeah, it's like you gotta get past trying to like make it even and just let Cause like I like to be in charge. I don't like to just totally let the fiber do what it wants. But like there's kind of this, like I put those in there because I knew if they do what they want, it's gonna look great. Like so it's there's it's not just completely out of control. It was it was done with intention. And so when you're doing, and I'm sure you, you probably know this from working with. Uh, spinning bulkier yarns but it's the same with art yarn it's like you want slow twist but lots of tension lots of uptake um, 
because with bulkier yarn, it, it's easy to get too much twist. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's, I'm gonna apply it. So I do. I want it a little over twisted, but uh, without that uptake, if it just sits and spins, it, it's really easy for it to just build up mm -hmm. too much twist. And and I have my ways of getting getting that stuff out. Like I've heard people say, like, oh, if it's over twisted, you can't get it out. And it's like, oh, okay. I'll show you how I do it. <laughs> that one I can share because it it like. Oh, that was the end of it. That's it. And I didn't opt to do any buttons on this this one. I'm just going to do the sequins. But I always like to have a white on hand. And honestly, I use this color more than just about anything. So if anybody needs a hint or they're like stuck on color, this golden mustard goes with everything. It's a chromatic neutral. And I love it because it you can use it with anything. It's a color, so it's not just the same as doing black or white, but it doesn't affect, you know, when you, you apply something with white, it can bring the color down. Hmm. But when you apply with black, it'll like really make it pop or stand out. Um, this color like goes with everything and it doesn't affect the um, kind of the overall tone. And so one thing I do, I'm not sure it's normal. And I never know what's normal and what isn't because I taught myself. So I just do what works for me, but, um, I'm always using this hand. I'm backing the twist out. And so, and when you do that, it, because in the thinner spaces in the yarn, the twist builds up, right? And so, but you really want twist in the thick spaces when you get ready to use those spaces. Cause like, so like this is a thicker area and that's where I want to put my trim. Because if I, if I try to put something this wide, I don't know if you can see something that wide, into a thinner space, mm -hmm. then I've got to wrap it multiple times because that space is, is thinner. It needs more, more twist, right? And something like this is going to be bulky. And so the more you try to wrap it, the bulkier it's going to get. It's not going to hang. It's not going to drape. It's going to be kind of, kind of tight. So you want things like this to go in the thicker spaces. But in order to do that, you need twist in those thicker spaces. And so when I'm working with thinner spaces, so and you can kind of see it here. This space has lots of extra extra twists here, whereas say this space here doesn't because it's thicker, right? And a lot of times when I get to like a big textured piece like that, you can leave it evenly distributed. So a lot of times I'll scrunch it though, because then it kind of it hides the plying thread into the texture and then just kind of lets the texture take over. So like I don't like having my thread show. Like I don't mind if it does a little bit. That's too, there's too much twist there. So I'm releasing it down. Um, it's funny cause I say I'm not a perfectionist, but like I kind of am. So it's like, I don't, I don't like over twisted or under twisted yarn. I kind of feel like there's an epidemic of underspun yarn across the internet. And I, I have, it's, I'm, I'm a perfectionist about it. I don't like underspun yarn. So I'm coming up on this nice big chunky piece here. And I kind of like, you know, I'd like to put something on that. It needs a thing. The thin spaces in the yarn gather the twists. The thick spaces don't. But I want twist here. If I keep going as I am and just let all of this twist absorb into my ply, then when I get to this section here, I'm not going to have the twist I need to ply it without it being loose. And I don't, I don't like under twisted sections in the yarn. Even if there's a lot of texture, I still want it to be balanced. So as I'm spinning, I'm backing this extra twist out so that it's now all that extra twist is kind of now been forced into this thicker spot. So I have more, more, um, twists there to work with as I'm coming up on it. So I'm going to add my sequins in here. And I don't want my sequins all caught up in the twist. So I try to keep it facing forward. Yeah, so like the, the time and effort is definitely in the plot. And so you can see it's kind of over twisted there. So I'm going to mm -hmm. back it back out and just let some of that twist release. So there, now we have that cute like 
texture from that little spot, but it's got a lot of fun sequins with it too. Not going anywhere. Cause yeah, I can't stand the thought of, I mean like what's the point of making it super pretty if when you go to use it, all the pretty stuff falls out. So I, I've tried to figure out ways to make it, make it stay. And not just stay, but like stay where I want it. It needs to, hang on, I'm in charge. Wasn't that wonderful? What a treat to be able to meet Jeremy, be in her studio, learn about her business thought processes and see all her beautiful art yarn and couture clothing that she creates. And it was just a treat to be able to see and hear about the different things she does, the items, and for her to teach us some of it. So what a wonderful time. And she gave me the gift of inspiration. I am so excited to work towards making a skein of my own art yarn. And I look forward to the treasure hunt for the items to go in it and just making it. So what a wonderful time it was. So at the end there, you saw her booth at an art show. And I just wanted you to see all her items that were hanging on display for sale and it was just great. So thank you for joining me on the Rehash Fiber Travel Adventure. This is episode one in the Sedona, Arizona region. I tell you, traveling just reminds me what a wonderful world we live in, what wonderful people are in it, and the new experiences. Seeing and doing just add so much more value to my mind. So if you're a traveler, you know what I'm talking about. And if not, I encourage you to do it. It is just great. So I am glad you were there with me. There's gonna be a couple more episodes and happy fiber art, happy fiber art travels, and thanks for watching.